Welcome to What's Out There. I'm Margie Wiggin and we're going to be exploring nature on the trails of Hopkinton. We have a wonderful resource here. Let's go see what's out there. the head of the center trail in Hopkinton. It's part of the Open Space Conservation Commission in Hopkinton, Halt Hopkinton Area Land Trust, also involved in these trails, and the Hopkinton Trails Clubs. So this is located at Claflin Place, across from Hopkinton Lumber, right on Main Street in Hopkinton. There is parking that's courtesy of the Michael Lisnow Respite Center, which is right over there, and a group of respite center uh, residents just walk through. So it's used by runners, hikers, and just people around town wanting to take a wonderful hike in the middle of town. Let's see what's out there. So here we have an information board where there is uh, copies of ceremonies that they've done here to do cleanup opening ceremony 2009 when the halt the uh, trails club started the trail and we also have a map of the area with the trails open space conservation commission start, different trails clubs and right here it says 0.0, .0 meters so this is the start of the trail there's also a really cool railroad tie on the ground over here because this used to be the hopkinton railroad this track right here was the hopkinton railroad track let's keep going so this is a really important thing to know about. The trail here is available for dog walkers as well as runners, hikers, bikers. But right here tells you clean up after the dog and it shows the dog on a leash. We do require leashes here because there are runners and hikers and we don't want anyone to be bothered. We want to have fun here. Bags are available. Clean up after your dog and dump the waste right here. Let's keep going. So one of my favorite spots when I start this walk is this beautiful garden that the Girl Scouts did. This is Girl Scout Troop 65040. They put in a bee garden and this is a really nice spot. There are crocus in here, there's some iris coming up, and there are some bushes in the back that I'm not even sure what they are yet because nothing's in flower. It's just a really nice spot at the beginning of the trail to have a little garden. Thanks Girl Scouts! Okay, so one of the great things is that the trail curves here. It's not just a straight trail. And we have this wonderful post here, which blocks any kind of vehicle access. There is a guy who maintains the trail that rides around, um, but he's not in a car for sure. And what we did was, or the people who built the trail, put some hemlocks against the people who live here, against the abutters, and some arborvitae to screen them a little bit from the trail because we want this to be an asset to the community, not something that people feel is intrusive. Let's see what's out there. So there are a lot of nice trees and plants along this pathway or this walkway. Right here, this is going to be a smoke bush, which means that it's going to pop out with some puffy, um, smoky looking thing. It's kind of grayish pink. It's really cool. Oh, look at this. This is Pacassandra, this beautiful green ground cover here. And we have some really beautiful forsythia in bloom. Just pop out at this time of year. You can bring them inside before they bloom and force them by putting them in water. But they're so pretty and they just brighten the whole landscape. I love that. So I'm hearing a lot of birds in the woods here. I hear cardinal, blue jay, robin, chickadee, and we have all kinds of plants here. Right here is a barberry. This has red berries in it in the fall, so that feeds the birds. And there are some vines on these trees, which is not so good. We have grapevine, we have bittersweet, I have seen poison ivy. What the vines do is they creep into the bark and they eventually damage the tree. So we love the wildlife, we wish there weren't so many vines. Let's see what else we have. Yeah. 
So here we are, we're about 200 meters in, and I know that because they have great trail markers here. We have some people walking towards us, but we're gonna take a right here because this is the start of the Wellzell Trail. This was put together by Dan Paleko from Eagle Scout Troop 4, and it's in honor of Andy and Jane Wellzell. This was uh, supported by the Hopkinton Community Preservation Committee. It's a great little side trail. Let's see what we have in there. So one of the great things about walking the trail is you run into the nicest people. We got Jerry Holland here who was the town clerk forever and she's so amazing. And then she was the mayor, not the mayor. The mayor, no, never the mayor. She ran the town. She the was town the manager and secretary assist, yeah, assistant. Which, who runs administrator. the town Yeah, she kind of ran the town. Anyway, and we got the fabulous Mike Tarosian who is the HCAM fabulous guy and he's yeah. a firefighter in Ashland and in Hopkinton. What yeah. else? You do a lot of stuff. I do stuff. a lot of things. Yeah. So anyway, it's great to be on the trail for many reasons. Yes, it is. Like this right now. <laughs> this is the best moment of my life for right now. <laughs> Seriously. Right now. I love this trail. Oh, and here we have some more of these vines. This right here is a grapevine. And then we got some bittersweet up in the tree over here. You can see some of the orange and red buds. And then up above us over here is a squirrel's nest in a tree. So we have all kinds of life and cool nature things here on this trail. So there are a lot of really cool trees here. We got pine trees, we got birch trees. Right here, this is the grapevine. This massive thing is a grapevine. This is probably why Tarzan used to swing to them by them. They're incredibly strong and huge, but it's just a grapevine climbing all over the tree. So there are some really beautiful rock walls out here of the old property lines. We have a really nice old wall coming this way, and then we have a beautiful wall going that way. There is a break in the wall here that we can walk through, and then we're going to come over to the bridge that's going across a brook. So here we're coming to a bridge. I just saw deer track. And uh, this is the bridge that Dan Paleka put in as part of his project, which makes this trail very walkable. We have a beautiful brook running through here that feeds the Ice House Pond that goes eventually to the Merrimack Valley River, river and to uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So it's very cool. One of the cool things about coming out at the beginning of spring, it's mid-April now, is that the baby plants are growing. So we have fern frond here, which is what it looks like all curled up before it opens up into a fern leaf. And in the back we have some older plants, which are poison ivy vines crawling up the tree. If you see a fuzzy vine crawling up a tree, don't touch it. That's poison ivy and it is still going to get you with the oils. Uh, we have birds making beautiful noises. We also can hear some gunshots because we've got the Hopkinton Sportsman's Club, which is over on Lumber Street in the background, but not to worry, they're far away and um, they're self-contained. Fern fronds, fern fronds. Then we walk on this cool railroad tie section. I hear chickadees. We have some birch tree over here. Lots of things to see here. So beautiful. Oh, look at this. This is some beautiful shelf lichen. One little piece right here and then all along this birch tree that has fallen down. And when it falls down and the lichen come into it and the fungus turns it back into soil. So amazing. Wonderful to see people out on the trail having a nice walk.
So we're almost at the end of the Wells Out Loop. And oh, over here we have some rock that was quarried as part of building the railroad. And you can see that there are cut marks right here where they would have been hacking away with stone saws or tools to cut out pieces of this rock. So this part is flat. You can see flat there and then they didn't need this section. Some little history here of the quarry that was used to make the railroad. Let's see what else we got. So back up onto the trail. Oh my goodness, look at this beautiful tree. So this is a birch, really beautiful. Going right up to the sky and I love this bark. Really cool. A little bit of lichen, but I'm liking this tree. I just heard a red-headed woodpecker. Very cool. I'm coming up to the end of the Wells that Loop Trail. You can see some of the, probably some of the quarried rock, or this might be from the Hughes property when they took that apart. I can hear trees creaking too. There's a tree leaning on another tree right here. It's not going to fall down, it's just noisy. Ooh. And this is a garter snake right here. I think he's alive. Yep, he's cold because snakes are cold-blooded. Yep. Let's move him so that a bicyclist doesn't get him. Go off the trail, buddy. All right. What a beautiful day it's turning out to be. It's getting kind of warm now that the sun's out. So this is a really cool spot right here on the trail. This is the whistle post and historical thing from when this used to be the railroad bed. That post right there is where anybody coming in this direction would blow on the horn or whatever loud thing they had to let the people know up on Main Street know that the train was coming. So this is the whistle post. It kind of was a signal to them to make noise. Um, this is the, the railroad operated between 19, 1872 and 1953 is what this says. And uh, I guess they usually place those posts a quarter mile ahead of where the cross road was to let people know. So it's kind of cool. And um, let's keep going, see what else we have. I'm hearing chickadees. Okay, so this is a really interesting historical place we have here. Talks about the timeline and the history and some of the things that happened along the way, what it was used for. Mostly was used as the railroad because between Ashland, Milford, and Hopkinton, there was a big shoe industry here. So they had to ship materials and sometimes some people. Um, when the, I guess it was in the late 1800s, shipped on the railroad and bring material to the store owners. Um, passenger service started in late 1872. All of the information is on these two signboards. Um, and it's also kind of a nice halfway point to have a little seat in this beautiful bench which is made out of trees, which I love. It's very natural. So we're going to go down to the Terry Field um, following here and I'll see you down there. So here we are, we're right at the edge of the Terry Field. It's a beautiful spot, it's privately owned, but it's just nice to look at that beautiful grass. We're about halfway along the trail here, and um, I'm just gonna sit in this beautiful stone bench and uh, enjoy the bird calls. And oh, look, here's John Ritz. John Ritz is a member of our Trails Club. John, can you take a minute to talk to us? Sure. With your Trails Club too. hat on? He's also our cameraman for HCAM. So John, <laughs> can you tell us about the history and 
regarding the trails club sure the the center trail is what the trails club re regards as our crown jewel in town um, it's our best known probably best used accomplishment when people say what does the trail cl trails club do the center trail is it um the nice town job Thank you. <laughs> you know, after the railroad took up the, the ties in 1950, the, the route just sat um, unused for a long time. Yep. The town purchased the land in um, the late 90s, 97-ish, mm -hmm. I'm told, when they bought the school property mm -hmm. um, with the intention of... Hopkins School. Yeah, well, what became the Loop Road and Hopkins yeah. and all that. Yeah. With the intention of making a trail so the kids from West Hopkinton could... Um, the western part of the town so could walk Woodville. in mm -hmm. and get in here. But really nothing was done for quite a while. Um, the Trails Club took up the, the baton on this one in 2006, went to town meeting. Um, I remember. And got money mm -hmm. to start work on the trail. Lisa Jackson yes. spearheaded that. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so we went out, she went out, um, we talked to a butters, made sure their concerns were met, oh. found a contractor cleared the trail, um, fixed up the bridges, made a beautiful trail, and in around 2009, we had a grand opening oh, of nice. the trail with um, people from the legislature came. We had a nice ceremony then. Yeah. Unfortunately, there were some erosion problems, oh. um, and the t trail deteriorated quite a bit yeah. um, after that. Mm -hmm. Did you say that um, the excavator kind of dug up a little too much? There was and then they had to bring in more fill to build it up again, like a railroad bed would be. Yeah, right. that, there was that, but the, we also ran into some really bad weather. Oh, yeah. Um, in there, so. Oh, actually, I remember 2008. Wasn't that a really yeah. bad snowy? So there had to be a second phase of trail mm -hmm. construction. Peter Legoy mm -hmm. led that one. Yes, thanks, Peter. Got another contractor in, rebuilt it, as you say, um, restored the the raised bed, yeah. fixed up the ditches so that they would work. Mm -hmm. um, and that gave us the center trail that you see today. The Trails Club is still active with it. We, um, we promote it and maintain it. We're out here. Um, we have an event in the springtime where we come out and clear the trail, clear the ditches to make sure that they still work. We yeah. have a, um, a moonlight walk every fall. Nice. Encourage people to come out for that. Yeah. And, um, and, yeah. and isn't Hopkinton Area Land Trust also steward of part of the trail? Yep, the, ha the land Michael trust. Michael Bolson. Michael Bolson. Bolson. So the land trust um, has the conservation restriction okay. on the land. Which so means, we don't pick anything. Which means they're the ones that say you can cut this tree, you can't cut this tree. They yeah. approve any of that for okay. most of the portion of the trail. And yes, Mike Bolson, who we met earlier, um, mm -hmm. he patrols this trail clears it up, make sure there's um, just mm -hmm. a, appropriate use on it. Yeah, we appreciate Michael Salp. He said he moved here in 1959. I think he said he was 10 at that time. Mm -hmm. And so he's really got a love for, for the trail and for this area. So thanks, Michael. And um, we're going to walk a little bit again and come to the next bridge. There are three bridges that have um, earth and then a culvert so that the water can pass through. So we'll meet you at the bridge. Thanks, John. Sure. So beautiful out here. How oh, awesome. So right here we have a mile marker, not a mile marker, it's actually meters. 600 meters right by this beautiful bridge. And the reason the meter markers are important is because if there were an emergency and you had to call for help, you could say I'm at the 600 meter mark and then they would know. It's about halfway along the trail, which is a little over a thousand meters. So they're, they're about every 200 meters or so. And this is a beautiful wooden bridge that's over a granite culvert. So someone carved out and put down stones underneath this so that the water can flow through and under and keep going. And there's a marker right here that says bridging the generational gap. So this was built by Girl Scout Troop 85290 with Robin Batchelder and Sherry Galigo. So thanks ladies for building this great bridge. So right here, we are looking at a what could be a red-tailed hawk nest. It could be a great horned owl nest. It doesn't look like a squirrel's nest because squirrels have leaves. 
So this is definitely a, a animal nest at the top of this tree, which leads me to believe it's red-tailed hawk, but it could be great horn owl. One of the reasons you should be looking up and around as well as down while you walk through this amazing trail. So here we have a really cool granite bench that was made out of stones from the foundation of a local property, the Hughes property that was taken apart. And it's wonderful that we can reuse that. And over here we have the end of the cross country trail that comes from the middle school parking lot. And it's a beautiful stone dust trail, snakes through the woods here. Um, everyone can use it, but it definitely is useful for the cross country runners. So they're running on something that's not asphalt. So here we have the beautiful brook coming through. This is the third granite culvert running under this beautiful bridge. There's skunk cabbage down there, which is one of the first things that comes up in the spring. And let's see what else we have up ahead. So one thing that's really noteworthy and important about the trail is that these culverts, these drainage ditches are really important to keep this trail working. The erosion that happened before was because the trail was too low and all of this water was on the trail and washed it away. So we, I really, really appreciate it when the neighbors keep these clear, which they do. And I also wanted to show you that the ferns, which we saw as little tiny fronds in the other well cell trail section, are doing all kinds of different things. So here we have little fern fronds, we have the ferns starting to come up and they're gonna leaf out and be just beautiful. Beauty all around here on this trail. So we're coming to the end of this section of the trail. We just passed the thousand meter mark. Right here, the halt sign talks about not disturbing plants, protected area. We have our dog provider section here and this pole prevents cars coming in. But this is not the end of this trail. This trail continues along the loop road and then it goes down to the parking lot and past field K and then ends where it goes onto Chamberlain Road. So this trail is actually a wonderful resource in the middle of the town for people to go across instead of going on the sidewalks where the cars are. So we really appreciate all the help from HALT and the Trails Club and the Conservation Commission in bringing these resources to our town. I hope you guys get out on the center trail. What are the signs of an opioid overdose and how can I recognize that somebody is experiencing one? Well, they're actually pretty easy to spot. A person who is experiencing an overdose may appear confused and have a decreased level of consciousness and alertness. They also may have constricted pupils. When you see somebody who's experiencing an overdose, the number one most important thing to do first is to call 911. Next, do rescue breathing. And finally, take out your naloxone kit and administer the naloxone. Naloxone comes in an easy to use package with instructions for how to use it. Each box of Naloxone may look different. They're all very easy to use and you do not need medical training in order to use it. So who should have nasal Naloxone? Well, everybody should have it to help a loved one who may be suffering from a substance abuse disorder or just to help a stranger in need. Obtaining Naloxone is easy. You can obtain it from your doctor, from a pharmacy standing order, or from any of the Department of Public Health sites. And today we'd like to go over some water tips to help you in your home check for leaks and show you some important uh, features of the water system and how you can help uh, protect in the, in the event that you do have an emergency. Uh, so the board we have here is just kind of a demonstration of the water system and how the water gets into your home. Uh, from the water main we have a line that comes into your property and right at the property line we have a shutoff called the curb stop right here and that's something that we're able to access in the event that uh, your valve inside the home does not work, so we can shut that off in any emergency. So one of the most important things for every homeowner that has uh, municipal water 
to know is where that main shutoff valve is in your home. Generally, that line is coming in facing uh, off the street, so it'd be in your cellar, uh, most likely, and it's on the side where the water line faces the street coming in. This valve right here is before your water meter. And what you want to do with that is just make sure that that turns. It's a quarter turn valve in order to shut, and that'll shut the whole supply off in your house. So if you ever had a uh, pipe that broke inside or if you had uh, a problem with a plumbing issue and you, in an, any emergency, that's where you'd go to first shut off your water, and that'll isolate your whole house for you. Uh, right next to that is the water meter, and the water meter can be one of the, uh, the best tools for you as a, a homeowner or resident uh, or businesses in order to make sure that uh, the, you have no internal leaks in the house. So the water meters read almost like a car odometer. The numbers go across, and what we recommend is every now and then, when you know that you're not running anything in the house, the dishwashers are off, washing machines are all off, is just to take a, a meter reading on that water meter wait an hour or two, then come back and take another reading. If you see that that reading has changed, then you know that something is leaking. And nine times out of 10, it's a toilet. Well, most of our high water calls are for leaking toilets, and they can use upwards of 200 gallons a night. Uh, most people think that they would hear the toilet running, but what happens is the tank will actually drain down into the bowl, and it's not until that tank is empty that it actually kicks on and refills again. So you may not be uh, near that and able to hear it when that actually ends up being emptied out. So we recommend that you, you do this check in order to help uh, make sure that you don't have anything leaking in the house. Also, our other number one call starting this time of year is for high bills is for water sprinkler use. And again, water meter is a great tool for seeing how much water you're actually putting out on the lawn. Uh, the recommendation is for about an inch of water uh, a week for your lawn. And this will give you a good indication of how much water is going out. So again, read, take a meter reading on that. After your sprinkler system runs, you can come back check the readings uh, that are in cubic feet, and there's a simple calculation, one cubic foot is uh, 7.48 gallons, and that'll give you an idea of how much water is actually going out on the lawn. Uh, so those are two of our biggest calls for, for um, high water use, and this water meter here will give you a good indication of what's going on in and outside of the house. Uh, one of the other things that we uh, recommend also is, uh, uh, during this time of year is, uh, to keep up with our news feed. We have a lot of things going on this time of year. We have uh, several hydrant flushing going on. A lot of businesses are required to do fire flow testing. And when that happens, that can stir up the system. So we try to give everybody as much notice as possible. And we put that out on our Twitter feed at uh, Hopkinton uh, Water. And we also do it, uh, if you want to get it via email, uh, there's a uh, link that we'll provide at the end of this that will give you an opportunity to sign up for our news feed. And again, we, we don't uh, inundate uh, your email with uh, notices. We only put out the important notices that uh, if there's a water break and there's going to be discoloration or some other important news so that you can re receive that directly uh, via email. Uh, so that's it for now, and thank you for watching.